Hello, all you hardcore boxing fans out there. How are you doing? It's Big P here, the voice of hardcore boxing. But you already know that, don't you? Because that's why you tuned in. Right. Uh, I'm joined today by my good pal from London, Terry. How are you doing, Terry? I'm all right, as you'd like to say. No, I'm all right, mate. Just all right. Like, like we said earlier, man, it's, uh, it's a quick turnaround from having watched the Brook fight to getting up and recording this. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it is. I do apologise, mate. It's only uh, 11 a.m. <laughs> Did you have a few beers watching boxing? Uh, not at all. You know what it was, Russ? So basically, right, so everyone thinks the boxing is going to be on pretty quickly. And then it turns out that ESPN delayed it while they were doing the college football. So I think it was, I, I can't even remember the teams. Was it the Florida Gators against yeah. Arkansas? Maybe. And basically, yeah, go on, sorry. Maybe, yeah, so the, the so Florida were absolutely dicking the slot. I'm not gonna lie, Russ. They were smashing him, and it's like like five minutes to go in the game. And you're like, just call the game off. Like you know, when like in American football, they need to have a ref just wave it off because it was like sixty points to ten or something. It's like you can't score enough points now. Just just let the game be done and let's get the boxing on. So we lost about forty five minutes, and then like you, I don't know if you heard about the boxing, but Russ. Like, they were trying to do a video replay, and that took another 40 minutes. So by the time Kel Brooks walking out, it's about half four, quarter to five. Mm. Yeah, it didn't finish about 10 past five this morning, and it only went 10 minutes, the fight. Yeah, it wasn't really that long. I mean, I think Crawford was pissed off. He was like, look, I need to get home. So Kel Brook basically got 150 grand a minute, didn't he? That's, that's good work if you can get it. Very good. Uh, all right, then. Well, we'll come to that in a bit. Uh, uh, we'll, 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 we'll come to that in a bit. We'll leave, we'll leave that till later. It's, uh, we'll go through these questions because I've done them in a different order. Right. AJ, fighting in China. What do you think? Does it happen? Mm -hmm. I don't think it does, if I'm being honest with you. No, no. Um, the Chinese are quite fussy, so you can only really go over there if you've got nothing controversial in your in your background. I think there've been too many things related to Islam that he can be linked to, where the Chinese might just say, "Nah, it's too much of a problem here." So I don't see it happening for that reason, and I also I don't think they'll build a Chinese heavyweight enough for it to happen. So I. I don't see it happening. I don't, don't even think he's that interested, to be honest. Yeah. All right, then. Uh, moving on. Uh, what about the female signing that Eddie's signed in China? Wouldn't you think they'd like to put her in with Terry Harper? Well, so first and foremost, you've got to give her credit because at least he's signing a reasonable number of women, right? Because... Uh, I said this yesterday. You've got four or five women in and around 135 pounds who, who could have decent fights with each other. Whether you like women's boxing or not, it's irrelevant, right? You, they can have a good fight, a good tear up, and you know they're decent enough. The problem is beyond those five, there's nothing. It's barren and it's empty. So if Hearn's saying he signed someone from China, they don't have a great record of of doing well at boxing. So I don't know what what value that is, to be honest with you. Yeah, it's, uh, well, she's WBH super featherweight champion, this Chinese girl is signed. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not excited. I think you and I talked about this years ago, Russ, and I said mm. a promoter should have just signed all the quarter finalists from the 60 kilo weight class in the 2016 Olympics. Should have signed all eight of them and said, you lot are just going to fight each other and make money. And we'd have a far better women's scene now than we've got. And it's clowning around. And here's the thing that annoys me, Russ, is you're getting guys now who are making their reputation of training women. And, you know, they're like, oh, look, look how many world champions I've trained. Yada, yada, yada. And I'm like, but why can't you do that with men? Or are you not that good? And you're basically trying to inflate your reputation by by trying to count the female world championships as equivalent to the male world championships, which at the moment, I don't think you can. 
two minute rounds, isn't it, Terry? Uh, and you've got to understand, I'm not take, having a dig here at Terry Harper, but we're two minute round. The running clock's down for one and a half minutes, aren't they? In a two minute round, staying out of range. And, and it's becoming, you only got to get a couple of jabs in and stay out way and you won't round, on you? I don't like that sort of style. I like the Shannon Courtney style. Rachel Ball, they had a tear up, didn't they? Yeah, and look, if we just, I know I know you're a numbers guy, Russ, yeah. so you'll appreciate this. If you really look at, at a round, right? Mm. In a, in a two-minute round, a third of your time is spent recovering, right? Yeah. In a three-minute round, a quarter of your time is spent recovering. Mm. And that's a big difference. And yeah. And so it should mean that you can do more with two minute rounds than you can with three and do it for longer. Yeah. So you should, you know, I, mean, like, I just think some of, some of these people aren't as good as been made out. So they have to do that cautious nicking a few rounds here and there to get the wins and then hope for some friendly judging as well, which is, which is a shame. Just yeah. let these people lose for God's sake. Why are people afraid to lose? I mean, when I look at it, you know, the GB girls, they, they're, they're geared for three minutes, aren't they? Jonas, Sam Anna Marshall, Katie Taylor. They well, I don't know if Katie Taylor were GB, but she's Olympia, won't she? But they they it's like they can fight at a good pace, can't they? A lot of, and these other women that we're seeing on these shows now, who are the opponents? They're shocking, Terry, aren't they? I, I mean oh, them last night. That girl who fought Katie Taylor last night. Did you see Peter Fury's thing that he put out? <laughs> No, I didn't. What did he, he said, say? He said it were on Twitter. He said a lot of things, Peter, last night. Uh, I'm not going to go into too... On social media, he said it were like putting a racehorse in with a donkey, and he said some other things as well that would surprise me. But when you've got people like Peter Fury coming out saying that and there's other 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 people, it's, it's a wake-up call, isn't it, to what's going on, isn't it, really? But... but... Savannah Marshall was kind of in that position as well, wasn't she? Yeah, but she's in the, a position now where they want the Clarissa Shields fight. They don't want to be putting... No, 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 wait, wait, wait. No, no, no. But let's take a step back. If we're complaining about putting racehorses in with donkeys... Yeah. And, and look, I like Peter, but Peter's yeah. a boxing man through and through. He understands what the game is. Yeah. Savannah Marshall had to fight Hannah Rankin. Now, let's be brutally honest. We Savannah know what Marshall happened in that fight, didn't we? It was an easy win for Savannah, wasn't it? It was hard to watch because Savannah Marshall could probably box at 81 and still look in good shape. Yeah. And I don't think Hannah Rankin is even a middleweight. No. She's a light middle tops. So that, that the weight difference was too much. The size difference we're was making, too much. The point we're making is. Let's have proper fights. Let's have Clarissa Shields, Savannah Marshall. I can get behind that because it's they're going to go at it, aren't they? Now, it's all about level. Shannon Courtney and Rachel Ball went at it, but they're not on Savannah and Clarissa's level, are they? No, but it was a compelling fight. And yeah, that's what... I want to see that again. I thought Ball nicked it. I thought the, 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 the knockdown cost Shannon Courtney. And I think where she spoiled herself for her behaviour after, but you can understand. She just had... Doing a fight. I mean, it's not nice getting a camera stuck in your face, is it? Coogan there sticking camera in her face when she's in dressing. Of course, she's going to refuse, isn't she? Um, what was else we were going to say? And when you when you get these women together, it doesn't always have to be a replica of the men. Like this whole dragging out someone's career and padding out their record. Why not just experiment and go? If I just get these women fighting each other two or three times over three years. Are people going to care what their win-loss record is or are they going to care that the fights were entertaining? That's it. Let's just get to... Let's just, let's just be done with it. I'm bored of this. And I think the lockdown's been good in one sense for us. That we got rid of all of these journeymen and all these B-level fighters and these C-level fighters. They can't make a living anymore. And hopefully boxing's rid of all that nonsense. And let's just get back to people having fights and it doesn't matter if you win or lose as long as you perform. Do you mean like the Elvis Doobs and the Willie Warburtons of this world? The journeyman. Yeah, see, those sorts of guys. In, in the old days, it was like Christian Late as well, who, yeah. who were just picking up. They were, they're picking up two or three grand every two weeks, aren't they? Just showing up, walking these guys around the ring. It's like that lad that fought, fought Danny Morell. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. It's embarrassing. This is why this, and everyone goes, oh, that's just boxing. And it's why no one makes money in boxing apart from five or six people. We're the only sport, Russ. Think about this. We're the only sport where at the end of 12 months, we still don't know who the best person is. Rugby. At the end of 12 months, I know who the best is. Football. I know who the best is. Cricket. I know who the best is. And in boxing, it's like, ah, you'll find out in about five years. No one cares anymore. Yeah, and another thing I want to touch on, but good good point about the journey mounting because obviously I, I've I, I've seen that close up and they turn up and and the parking up in Range Rovers, aren't they? <laughs> and the fighters who were there to beat them up, <laughs> they're turning up in a sponsored car and you know that kind of thing, isn't it? It's it's, it's, it's hilarious because when you when you see these guys, they've got good jobs. Like there are a few guys who are scaffolders, roofers, or whatever. And they're getting their little, that, that journeyman money is like, if that's investment money. That's what they're buying properties with. Yeah. And you know, they're, they're just living that life, Russ. Yeah, I know, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, I've seen it with my own at, eyes. At our expense. Think about this, Russ. It's at our expense as boxing fans. When I first started with Dennis, I said, what's he, he, he doing over there, him? So what he missed, he's got 14 plate range over about nine months old. He goes, oh, that's who is it? I goes, Journeyman, what, what is he doing? Is he bang at it doing gear? He's like, I'm not gonna say which fight. He says, No, 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 journeyman, they do well. And I said, and I was like, I couldn't get my head around it. And I thought, no, nah, he's, he's got to be taking piss out of me here. And I was obviously, as my eyes started opening to it all, I'm thinking to myself, we've got British champions fighting for European titles, driving decent cars, but they're like Astras. We've got journeymen driving Range Rovers and BMW X6s and yeah. wearing watches, they're really nice watches. I'm thinking to myself, it's all back to front, isn't it? At that level, yeah. Like, <laughs> and you don't have to sell a ticket. Russ, you don't have you to sell a ticket, up. do you? Yeah, you just show up, take the guy through the rounds. If he gets a bit happy, dig one in his ribs and say, nah, slow down. You know, you're, you're, you're literally in there talking the guy through the fight. Just to get the prospect used to fighting under the lights and bringing him on. It, it, it's, it's, could you imagine bringing a journeyman on to play for Liverpool against Real Madrid? We're going to just let you have a little run. Just have a move around and that. Don't worry if you lose ball and that. Could you imagine that? Uh, Liverpool have had a few of those guys like Jimmy Traore and Igor Bischan. They've had, they've had a few passengers in their team over the years. Hey, Jimmy Traore saved one on line off Shevchenko, didn't he? <laughs> in, uh, in AC Milan finally in 05. Do you remember that? Yeah. Team Jimmy <laughs> Traore. But when I think of bad players, I think of Richard Dunnan and, and Titus uh, Tobin. Bramble. Tobin Bramble. <laughs> hey? Titus Tobin. Anyway, moving on. Uh, we spoke about women's boxing, haven't we? So I'll cross that one out. Fury Wilder, do you remember me a couple of months ago saying it's going to end up in court and everybody said, Porky, you're a hater. And I said, look, do you think somebody of Al Heyman's status, who is a lawyer, went to Harvard, is just going to let a third fight like that slide? But it looks like they're, they're at it, doesn't it, with legal things. and you know, So it's getting messy, isn't it? What do you think to that? Oh, now, Porky, you are a Fury hater, though. No, let's not lie. You know, oh, <laughs> his, his old man was calling you out. <laughs> right, loyalty, don't I? Me, yeah, loyalty, that's what I like. I don't like disloyal people. But Has what, his old man rung you up yet? No, it's, John Fury can ring me anytime. I've got his number, he's got my number. Ring me anytime, oh, John. Really? All right, John, nice fella. You, but here's the thing, Russ how many big fights has Fury really got left? Right? He's got, he's definitely got one with Joshua, maybe two. Yeah, and then. Who do you want to see him fight, really? Do I want to see him fight Dillian? Nah, nah, nah. He wipes the floor with Dillian. He wipes Dillian out, doesn't he? Yeah, so I don't want to see that fight. So really, the wilder fight is, if you're trying to cash out, and I think MTK will want to make some money on their investment, the wilder fight will happen. It just won't happen next. And I think when Al's sensible, what he'll probably say to Wilder is, have a couple of fights. We'll get you in a couple of rematches with guys you've been in with before. Let's get you back being a killer and then fight Fury again when it's 
when it means something a bit more and there's more money in it. And I think that's all that needs to happen. You know, the karma heads need to come to the table and reach an agreement. Yeah. Uh, so do you think that they'll they'll it'll not end up in Supreme Court or wherever they're talking? You think they'll just work a deal out? It's like the whole Canelo thing, isn't it, Russ? There comes a point when you're like, are we just going to spend millions suing each other, or are we just going to come to a way, come to an agreement on how we split the money and make money? That's all it is. Do you remember when Frotch left Mick Hennessy and our our devoed went to Mick Hennessy and Mick took him to court and they settled. And I said, well, are you never going to have a contract again? And Carl said, no, I'm not. I said, well, why, 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 why are we still with Eddie Earn? So I've got an handshake with him. Eddie's like him. They don't like litigation. Do you know what I mean? They just prefer to get on with a job and go out and graft. Because while you're fighting litigation, you can't concentrate on your job, can you? Um, I think it's different reasons. I think Frotch is genuinely a guy who's like, let's just get it cracking. Like, let's keep making money. Hearn's not stupid. Hearn knows if he sues or gets sued, I can ask for all kinds of documents during discovery. And then we'll find out everything. Then we'll find out he's been lying for years. So the way the way you the way you keep your lies away from the fans is by not not putting yourself in a position where the court can order you to release documents, emails, and all that sort of stuff. It's why Hearn will never sue. It's why you that's why you can say what you want about him, Russ, and he will never sue you. Do you think that the Steve Collins case with Barry Hearn, where Barry Hearn had to pay him a million quid? If you Google that, Steve Collins versus Barry Hearn, it's all on Google. When, but do you think that when Barry Hearn were exposed with his lies and things behind the scenes, we what what were going on? Do you think that that damaged him because he nearly bankrupted him, didn't he? Did he have an heart attack <coughs> right about that time? Do you think that that left a mental scar on the Hearns and that they felt that? We're never ever going to be going into litigation again after that because they aren't, have they really? They always stay away from it, don't they? They get them to sign something like Frotch and Burn, Ricky Burns cleverly to say that they, they're they leaving on their own accord and they've no ties or something, you know, to the previous promoters. You know, they cover themselves, don't they? Well, so I think that's the right thing to do. I think it's always right when you when you leave. You should always leave on a handshake and say, listen... We've done our business together. I'm off to go and do something else. I, I think that's just that should that should be one of the things that makes boxing different. Yeah. Um, in terms of not wanting to get sued, I think you're more valuable when people don't know. So Hearn can run around saying, "Look how many millions Joshua makes per fight," and we don't really know because nothing's ever gone to a purse bid. And even in America, I don't think they they declared Joshua's person in the US, did they? No, they kept it on the wraps, didn't they? Yeah, and remember what happened with Povetkin. So for the Povetkin fight, the Russians said, no, no, we'll go to purse bids. If we don't like the offer you give us, we'll go to purse bids. We've got $50 million here ready to bid. What have you got? And then they came to a deal and Povetkin was well looked after. Same yeah. thing with Vladimir. Vladimir was really well looked after because people were willing to go to purse bids for that fight if they had to. Yeah. Yeah, all right then. Moving on then, do you think that uh, Fury Caballel happens in uh, two, three weeks, is it? Two and a half weeks? Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it doesn't. Um, I w but having Fury on that card, though, would make it a hell of a card, just f from my own perspective. That's me being selfish. But I can also see it not happening because a lot of fights are just falling through, aren't they, Russ? Like, yeah. we, we've, been, we've been promised a lot and not much has really come through. So I don't see it happening, but then I don't see... They're not going to do a switch at the last minute and put Fury in with Joshua for December 12th, are they? So I don't know. What does he do? Yeah. Uh, moving on, then. Kel Brook. Uh, before... Oh, sorry. Let me back up to a pre previous one. What we were talking about, the slots, Sky slots. Now, Dillian White's fight with Povetkin is, is off and off, off on on the twenty first, isn't it? So they had a pay per view slot available. They put Conor Ben on, headlining. But if you back up a week to last night, why couldn't they have Kel Brook on pay per view? Because they had that slot, didn't they? Free slot. Well, have Kel Brook on pay per view. 
on the 21st. Oh, put it back a week. But if Aaron wouldn't have budged, they could have still used it last night, couldn't they? They could have done the Katie Taylor show and then gone into the, like the American one. You remember when Clinton Woods fought Crawford Ashley? Well, that were in England, and then in the night time, it went through towards Lennox and what it somebody else, Holyfield or somebody, I forget now. Yeah. And if you remember that card, that, that Clinton card, when he fought Crawford Ashley, that was like the EVU, the Commonwealth, and the British or something, wasn't it? Yeah, that, and then and a, and a and WBC then, mandatory slot. Yeah, and then if you go down the card, there was about four other title fights going all the way down. Like, you know, you got down to like area level belts. Like, there were meaningful fights for about five or six of the belts, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Crawford Ashley at the time were knocking everybody out, massive puncher. Clinton were, were coming through. And if you look at that, how long ago was that? 18, 20 years ago? Probably 18 years ago, that. No, it might, might not have been that long. I don't know. It was a long time ago. 99, wasn't it? 99, 2000. 99, might have been. It's a long time ago, that, isn't it? Yeah. Was that before, after Hayes bashed up Crawford Ashley? That's probably before. And David A, he's not fought Crawford Ashley. No, I think they sparred and David put, yeah, he put hands on him. Oh, David put hands on him. Yeah. Did he? Yeah, and he was like he was young as well. Oh, but I'm just saying, going back then, the uh, the 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 pay per view slots they, they did a they did a going into an American one, didn't they? Clinton and Crawford, and then in the and then in the early hours it sort of went to America. Why couldn't they do that last night with Kel Brook? They could have had English show and then gone straight to the American, couldn't they? Can I be honest, Russ? It yeah. wasn't a strong enough card to justify that. <laughs> What the, the the sky one last night? No, well, both of them. Let's let's be honest, right? That that card that Sky delivered last night were embarrassing, as you'd say. And then what Bob Arum delivered was kind of just warmed up crap, really, wasn't it? And and look, look, no one can try and convince me a thirty-four year old Kel Brook is a main event attraction. Sorry, man, not with the way that he's lived his life, yeah. not with the two damaged eye sockets, not with the Dominic. Few key, some Spanish weight, a guy that he's got. Not with no, 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 he's not a main event. Guy. Yeah, he's not. He's not. He's never been serious about this thing. Mm. Do you know what I mean? He he has not been serious about this thing, and he's he paid a heavy price last night. Yeah, he did. He paid a heavy price. Uh, oh well, we might as well talk about the fight then last night. The rest of the card were dog shy. But what did you think to the card? And I also want to talk about Andre Ward and Tim Bradley because I think them two, Paulie uh, uh, are, de- are decent, aren't they? You know, behind the mic. Uh, it's, it, it, it's tricky. I think sometimes you can just hear an American accent and we just assume that they're better automatically. So I think Andre is really good because, you know what, he's just the same way. The same way as when he just slapped Carl Froch about. He was just measured with it. Oh, just you prick. <laughs> he ran out of rounds. Froch ran out of rounds. He had a bad start because he tried something different. He was were, were collecting data and then he put it on him. Mate, mate, he was still oh, buffering by round better. 12, wasn't it? <laughs> Listen, if it had been a 15-rounder, Froch should have done him. I know, I think it would have been like, please restart, Carl. <laughs> no, mate, so... About Ward and uh, Bradley. Um, I think, I think Andre is really good. So, Timothy Bradley blows hot and cold. He says some stuff. Like, you think about this. That whole fight, Tim Bradley's talking about Kell Brook as a welterweight. And we're all there watching going, well, why didn't you fight Kell Brook? Do you see what I mean? Like, like, no one even asked him, Tim, you were welterweight back then. Why didn't you fight Kell Brook? No, he no, knocked not. it back, didn't he? When he was mandatory for WBO, he knocked it back, didn't he? Yeah, so so that would have been an interesting story to know, you know, what 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 Tim understood about him. But they they play this corporate game. They they're no different to to what we have over here, us. It's just that they've got an American accent. They love yeah. the gig too much. Yeah. So, I don't so really you know, know who I like now as a pundit. Yeah. So I'm not sure. Because if you think about it, right, they stick it to people who aren't signed with Bob Arum. But the people who are signed to Bob Arum, ah, oh, mate, they're, they're just like Sky. So so we like Andre Ward because he said Josh was carrying too much muscle, but Josh is not an ESPN guy. We don't see them really criticising the ESPN guys in the same way. 
Yeah, Let's I noticed forget. that. I noticed that last night. Yeah, so so they have they have company man syndrome there too. So yeah, yeah. Oh, it's called company man syndrome. <laughs> That's a good one, that. Yeah, but no, I genuinely I like those two together. But they've been mates since they were kids, so they've known each other for years. Oh, wow. Tim Bradley and Andre Ward. Have they? Oh, did they go to Olympics? No, they fought. They fought each other's amateurs. I think Tim was a little bit older than Andre Ward, but they fought each other in the amateurs. Uh, something like 75 kilos, which shows you how big Tim Bradley used to be. Mm. Bradley wiped Darren Barker out in amateurs, didn't he? He was a good amateur. Like, he had the same style in the amateurs as he does his approach, just hard as nails. Mm. Yeah. But, but wait, in terms of the fight, <laughs> it, it's everything I believe in life. There's some people who are poodles and there's some people who are pit bulls. Last night you had a poodle in with a pit bull. You know, as soon as Crawford said, right, I'm not having this guy take the piss out of me. As soon as he just went, just he switched to Southpaw and that right hand of Kel Brook's world went upside down in a heartbeat. Like, Kel, I don't know if you remember in the WWE when The Undertaker would just jump over the top rope and land on someone like Brock Lesnar. Yeah. It looked like Kel was trying to jump over that top rope and hit someone in the crowd. Honestly, Crawford hit him and he took about, I don't know, six or seven steps away. And I was like, this guy's looking to quit already. And I think Crawford knew that. I think Crawford knew as soon as I hurt him in and around that eye area, he would just look for a way out. All come flashing back to him, didn't it? Yeah, but it looked, it looked like like he was just having some some Vietnam flashbacks. Did you think he and quit? The, so, so no, so, so I think there are two things, right? There's quitting. And that's the, I don't know if you remember the guy that just walked out the ring before the bell even rang, the heavyweight guy, I forget his name. He just walked out the ring, Porky. Didn't even take the fight. So there's that. That's quitting. I think yeah. sometimes these boxers look for the ref to just end it, take the decision out of their hands. And I think Kel was like, I hope this gets stopped. That's what I think. I don't know if, he, if he'd had to do the 12, would he have done the 12? Probably. But yeah, I think he's like, look, I've got my 2 million quid. I don't have this in me anymore. You know, I, I, I managed to do what I had to do to get one last payday. Here you go. But Crawford, Jesus, man. Like he, Crawford's that, that rare human being where he's just horrible, isn't he? Like you, you look at Crawford and he's a guy who, who looks like if he wasn't boxing, he'd be moving 50 kilos a day yeah, between yeah. Nebraska and and Miami and Los Angeles. He, he's that sort of ruthless guy. Yeah. You see what I mean? He'd be that he's guy, that... Uh, Harry O, wouldn't he? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It'd be Harry he's... O, wouldn't he? Him who uh, bankrolled uh, Death Row. Yeah, no, exactly. That's, yeah. And and he'd be that, he, you know, he'd be that small guy that no one even bothered. Like, you know, he'd be sat there in a the pub and you just leave him alone. Everybody, everybody be ringing him, and you, you wouldn't even get to sit with him unless you wanted a full bird, would you? Yeah, exactly. And he's just, he's in everything he does, he doesn't give an inch. Do you see what I mean, Russ? He's just, ah, mate, he's he's impressive in a lot of ways. The problem I think Crawford has, and I tweeted this not long ago, he's going to suffer from the Mike Tyson syndrome, where we reward him for the way that he beat people and not necessarily for the people that he beat. So I think Bob Arum's got to dig in his pockets and start paying for these opponents now, like uh, Errol Spence and so forth. Who do you think wins that? It depends what Errol Spence is still there, because don't forget that car crash. May, that car crash may have turned him into Kell Brook. Yeah, it might have done, yeah. Turned him into Kell Brook. I feel sorry for Kell Brook, but do you feel that Kell Brook's career has been awfully managed from top to bottom do you feel that i know people in sheffield that are worried for kel brook now mate they feel that he's going to go off at rails because he doesn't take much with kel and that he'll be in a bad way but, do you, but you, feel that that you, just answered, you just answered your own question right if kel brook's going to go off the rails because he lost for a third time then what happened when he lost for the first time what happened when he lost for the second time yeah at some at some point it, it, it's his it's his responsibility, right? At some point, you've got to look at Kel and say, you're a grown man. 
Yeah. You've got the choice to be a professional athlete. You've got the choice to to prolong your career. You've got the choice to to not be messing around in Tenerife. You've got the choice to not be messing around in Dempsey's and all these other nightclubs in Sheffield. You've got the choice not to be messing around on Ringing Low Road and people's house parties and whatnot. You've got these choices, Kelbro. And you've made the wrong choices. Now, is that because you've got the wrong people around you? Maybe. I think if you had Dennis managing him, it had a completely different career. Yeah. Yeah. It's... Uh... And what about Sky not putting it on uh, on, on on the slots, Terry? What, do you feel that Johnny Nelson wronged Kel? Because that's the word up this end. That he, he could have done more for him help, to help him out. What do you think? But what, why, why, why does Johnny have to do anything? Well, he, he's always saying it's his boy and blah de blah and he's always sort of looked out for him, hasn't he? But I've heard when the push come to the push, he sided with the Sky Top Brass. Okay, but you're Johnny Nelson. You've known Kel since you were, what, 10, 11 years old? Yeah, 10. If, John, if Johnny's telling you, nah, he ain't got it, then he ain't got it. You think some of that's been going on behind the scenes? They've been whispering, saying he's partying and this and that, and people have disappeared well, themselves. I don't even think you have to whisper it. It's just well known now, isn't it? Well, yeah, I suppose, yeah. I mean, he, this is this is what happens, and and people need to understand the the margins between being great and being a wasted talent. They're so small. Look at Crawford, Russ. When have you ever seen Crawford in public out of shape? Like he's Never. he's always in the gym. Even if he hasn't got a fight, Crawford's in the gym. He might just be hitting the bag, or he might just be coaching someone. Always in the gym because. It's his craft. He's perfecting his craft. And he surrounds himself with people that will push him to the limit. Mm. He, that's what happens. Who's Kel Brook brought through? Where, who, are the, who are the young boxers that cut their teeth sparring Kel Brook? Yeah. Where are they? Willie Hutchinson sparred him, didn't he? Not recently, didn't he? We, we don't even know, but we don't even know about that guy anymore. He's irrelevant. Look at... Look at Crawford, though. Crawford will get Jabel Herring in the gym. He'll get Shakur Stevenson in the gym. Mm. Young, hungry fighters who can push him. Mm. That's the difference, Russ. And, and too many of these guys, they, they, they play at being professional. Nah, I'm a pro boxer, and they love all that, being on TV and all this sort of rubbish. But no, no one's wanting to live that life. No one's wanting to say, actually, this is my craft, it's my platform to a better life. Because boxing's not a job, you know this, Russ. It's a platform. If you get on Sky, it's a platform. You've got to leverage that into something else. It's why I quite like Nicola Adams. Nicola Adams took boxing and she's turned it into a media career that seems to be growing. And I'm like, fair enough. That's how you treat boxing. If you don't use your time in the limelight to build a business that will carry on after you retire, you're an idiot. Yeah. What next for Kel Brook now then? Do you feel that the rumours uh, uh, doing the rounds that he's going to keep fighting because there's two sides to the story. There's one rumour doing rounds. He's going to keep fighting. He's going to come back to Sheffield and train, but it could be Coldwell or Dominic. They're the two names being thrown about. Or, or like we've just spoke about, the other story is he'll go off the rails. Which do you think he'll do? Because he trained with Coldwell before, didn't he? Didn't he? Didn't he? At some point in his career. I think, I, think, I think he'll do both, to be honest with you, mate. I think he'll go off the rails. He'll blow, a, he'll blow a couple of hundred grand and he'll go, right, let me just sell my name. I'll sell my name to whoever loses between Danny Garcia and Errol Spence. I'll just sell my name so they can rebuild. And that's what you'll see. Now, who will train him? Uh, he should just go with Glenn Rhodes. Just for, forget all the nonsense. Go with the best trainer in Sheffield. Just go with Glenn Rhodes because you know, I think Smedley's retired now. So just go with Glenn Rhodes. Yeah. Glenn Rose doesn't get uh, much kudos, really, does he? Do you think it's because he hasn't had a British champion or do you think it's because he doesn't put his son in the mix and kiss arse to be around that scene? Do you think? What do you think? Glenn's going to slap me when I say this. I think it's because Glenn is better known for his community work than he is for his professional boxing work, which I think, to, for me, is respectable. I really respect that. But I think to the casual boxing fan, it means you don't see him on 
on these channels talking, there's talking that he's not doing the podcast. He's not, he's not doing the media circuit because if he did, then I think people would look at him differently because yeah. like Glenn Rose's story is fantastic. Yeah. And he really knows boxing. Like he's not one of these, you know, like, like these box, these boxing trainers out the East end who are two hands up and just run around like a robot. He's a guy that's got some movement to him. He, I mean, he's, he knows how to make you slick if you, if you're capable of being slick. So I quite I just like Glenn. I think he's a good man. All right then. Moving on from Kel, then we wish Kel Brook all the best, Bobby. Wilder, has his head gone? We don't know, Russ. That that's what's really difficult about all of this. Like, you gotta let boxers have their delusion, right? Because you think you're getting paid to get your head punched in for like 36 minutes. So you've got to have a bit of madness about you. Like you're not gonna be wired right. Now is this Wilder being who he's always been and we're just seeing it differently? Or, or is this Wilder having been thrown off his game? We don't know yet, Russ. I think we just got to see how this one plays out. Yeah. But the key thing with him is he's just got to get back fighting as soon as possible. Like, stop waiting for Fury. That fight will always be there. Just go and jump in with someone. I don't care who it is. Go and fight that, oh, what do you call it? Uh, go and fight that Otto Valin that Fury fought. Just, you know, just rebuild. So, give us some. Brazil. Again. Yeah, give yeah, give us something that will give us hope that the old wild is still there, and then let's go from there. All right then. Uh, yeah, there's a good one here for you. Liam Williams against is it Denzel Bentley who beat Efron the other night? Do you think that'll yeah. happen, or do you think the t- the the, t- the talk is Efron Bentley trilogy? Who wants to see that? Well, hold on, hold on. Who, who sent that question in? No, these are what I wrote out myself. These. Yeah, but look, look at Russ, mate. Why, why, why are you, why are you trying to let, let Denzel chill, man? He's been busy this summer. Let, let, let him have a few months to rest his body, fighting Liam Williams. Liam's got some Demetrius Andre issues to deal with, you know. Then, then Denzel will see after that because, you know, I think we need to remember. Number one, I thought Denzel won the first fight, so I thought the second fight was unnecessary and shouldn't have happened had the judges done their job the first time round. Yeah. But I think the important thing is you got to remember Denzel barely had 15 fights, has he? You, you're, you're British champion in about 15 fights. Mm. So they've moved him really quickly. And let's not underestimate how good Hefron is. I know people say, oh, he's washed up. Hefron's still a decent fighter. He looked in good nick and he's still relatively young. Yeah. I think Denzel's got to British level. But my worry is people start saying stuff like he needs to fight this guy, he needs to fight that guy. Anyone that's got these thoughts, can you just say nothing? Don't say anything, stay out of it. What Denzel needs to do is have a few fights where he can now work on the boxing education side of things. Because he's he's got to where he's got by being a decent boxer with power. Yeah. But at that world level, as you know, Russ, that's not enough. At that world level, you've got to make little tweaks and little adjustments like Terence Crawford did. You've got to be able to, to make changes in real time. You've got to try things. If that doesn't work, try something else. And you, to do that, you've got to be a well-educated boxer. And I think Denzel needs to now use the time wisely to, to bed in that education. Because I don't, want, I don't want him being rushed and he's having to survive on his power and so forth. Because then he's not going to enjoy the experience. And I think a lot of times boxing is about enjoyment. So Liam Williams is on his own path. And like he held the British title for a long time. He's been in and around that level for too long because did he fight Liam Smith for the British as well? Uh, yeah, I think so, yeah. I'm not sure. They did fight though, didn't they? Yeah, so, so he's been at that level, at that top British level. Liam's been there a long time. So you can't really have him against Denzel. Like that's it's not the right thing to do. Denzel's looking at these guys like you know, a few tick over fights with guys like Marcus Morrison, for example. Let him, let him get in with someone like that. Let him fight people of his generation and let's see what he does while he works on his education and then kick him on. You, like you always say, Russ, you got to do it the right way. All right, then. Uh, George Groves, James DeGale, and Nathan Cleverly, Carl Zaggy. They Could you imagine them at Sky and being company men? Um, they seem to have walked away, don't they, from the sport? 
So George is still in the sport. So George yeah, I know was, he's, he's like a, he works for that man, advisor, advisory role or some yeah. management group or something. Like. Yeah, so George is still involved. James isn't, but James is still in the gym. I'm not. I'm not about TV work though. They don't seem to be getting a look in, do they? Or they or they're not bothered. Well, George has got Channel Five. Yeah, but I'm on about on Sky. Yeah, but there's more TV networks than Sky, Porky. Yeah, I know, but I'm just saying George has done work for Sky, hasn't he? Yeah, but there's only so many slots. So let, let's yeah. let's let's go, let's go through the Sky slots, right? Yeah. Adam Smith ain't going anywhere. Yeah. Mac is not going anywhere till he gets bored. So that's two slots locked down on the commentary side. Yeah. And then Eddie's got to get his his real mates in. So Caldwell always gets the shot. Bell yeah. always gets the shot. And even Froch gets the shot, right? So you, you got five people there. Then you got Johnny Nelson and Anna. By the time you, you got eight or nine people that Sky carry with them, Russ. Yeah. So it's hard to, to bring people in and out. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and so, so, so if you've got the question of are Sky using the right people, my answer is probably not. Do I think George would be better? Yes. Do I think you can control George in the same way? No, he's too rich. In the same way, they can't control Froch. Froch is too rich to be controlled. Do you think that's why Froch uh, he, he says what he wants when he's on there? But I think, I think that's just who Carl is. Yeah. Like, he's one of the people who, how do I put it, Russ? He's been successful being himself, so the public are used to that. Other people got successful pretending to be something else. He didn't. Mm. So fair play to him. All right, then. Uh, what do you think about Tony Bellew's comments in the Sun newspaper yesterday? Why is he in the Sun anyway? I don't know if it's something that's been took, took, took with an interview. Hang on a second, I'll get it up on my phone. I don't know if it's something that's been took from an interview or what. Uh, there you go. Man, I can't even see that. The the contrast is too much. Tony Bell, you're there, Sun newspaper. Now you're gonna have to read it. You won't realize until you. It just says on the front. Uh, I, obviously, I I haven't, I haven't read it. I've just this is just a screenshot. Yes, he can. Tony Bellew says Callum Smith has every opportunity to knock out Canelo. That's in the sun. Well, if he gave an interview to the sun, then that's, there's a problem there already, right? Uh, maybe they've just took it off of something he said on IFL and then maybe they're just trying to cause problems for him. I don't know. <laughs> but what do you think about him saying that, whether he said it to the sun or whether he said it to IFL? I don't know, but... I think it's IFL and some matter took it out of the bits from the on the back page of the Sun website on the sport part. Uh, yeah, they're both rotunda boys. Up, yeah, yeah, they're, they're both rotunda boys, aren't they? Yeah. Uh, I would. If someone told me Porky was fighting Mike Tyson on pay per view, I'd still back you. Yeah, many ones. But do you no, think I would, man. they underestimate your speed, Russ? I know, yeah, yeah. The, the speed of the takedown. <laughs> No, 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 no. We saw the bag work, Russ. The feet were all over the place, but the hands were sharp. They were crispy. <laughs> that was about five years ago, that. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they haven't seen the new tricks you've got. Yeah, I know. Uh, C Callum Smith, he went life and death with John Ryder. A lot of people said that he lost. I believe he Ryder nicked it. Uh, do you feel that... Obviously, he fought that Nicky, well, whoever, with a kickboxer. He went 12 with him and Rebras has struggled with him. But do you feel that he's got the tools to beat Canelo and the power? Uh, it's not even about that, is it, Russ? Because you know that if they had a sparring session together, Callum would probably give Canelo all kinds of trouble. But can Callum Smith really survive a US fight week and having to do all the stuff that you have to do and all the pressure and all the scrutiny and all the... You know, all the all the nonsense that comes with fighting Canelo. Can he can he survive all of that and still be the best version of Canelo? They have three hour media mornings, don't they, over there? It's yeah. quite training. Fox was telling me when he fought over there, he said the media is unbelievable, isn't it? They all gather around you and, and you're like on a chair, aren't you? And you're swarmed by them and your mind's going ten to a dozen. Do you think that's all to to put you off your game plan and kind of thing? Mm -hmm. Well, okay. If you look at the people who have been good at it, guys like Mayweather, 
they don't say too much. You see, everyone's trying to give the best answer they can when the media show up, right? Yeah. But if you're smart, you just give the answer you gave last time. That's why, you know, whenever they ask Mayweather, so what do you think about Errol Spence? And he just goes, great fighter. Great fighter, talented kid, you know, still needs to get some experience. But yeah, he's a good fighter. And he says that about everyone. And that means that he doesn't have to waste any energy thinking about it. It's just the same answer every time. Yeah, it's a pity when Clinton went out there to fight Tarver and they swarmed on him. He'd never seen that like that, Clinton. And I've I've see, seen the footage and I know Clinton and he seems it seemed uh, unsettling for him, if you know what I mean. He never fought away from home very good anyway, but some fighters just don't take good to it. They just want to fight, don't they? Yeah, but, but at that level, when you're being paid millions, Russ, you've got to be able to do it all. Yeah. Otherwise... Don't don't put your hand up for those sorts of fights. Yeah, yeah. All right then. Uh, Povetkin, Dillian White too. Does it happen at all? I mean, is it possible that Povetkin could go a different route? Um, they said there's a rematch clause, right? Yeah. So the fight sort of has to happen, and this is a good reason for it not to happen. My my thing is it messes up the WBC position because if Fury fights in December, that's a voluntary. Yeah. And then the WBC have to call the mandatory, I heard, for 2021. So when does that, when does it, when does the mandatory happen? It can't happen before Easter next year. And even then, like, by the time Dillian's fought Povetkin, he would have been in Portugal for nearly a year. Can yeah. his body really hold up after that? Well, is so it I think, for tax reasons, isn't it, mainly? Um... I think there are more practical reasons for being in Portugal than tax because you'd only, you know, that would only work for tax reasons if you were domiciled there. So he'd have to be paying Portuguese tax. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So I don't know, I don't know what the Portuguese tax rate is for, for foreign, foreign boxers, but there are probably more practical reasons, you know, like, you know, being able to get away from everyone, which is why you train in Portugal. Because who like Shook Knight? Hmm? Who like <laughs> Shook? <laughs> <laughs> hey. But no, look, I I can see the WBC putting someone else in as their mandatory. I can see that happening. Mm-hmm. Or Povetkin would have to fight someone else. Or the, actually, I'll rephrase it. The winner of the povetkin Dinian fight will have to fight someone else. And I can see them saying, you got to fight Wilder to become mandatory for Fury. I can see that happening. Well, if the, I'd like to see Dillian White against Wilder. They've both got a lot to prove now, haven't they? That's true. So, all right then. I can see that happening next year. Ryan Rhodes against Kel Brook at 154 at the peak. Who wins? Kel. Kel. Ryan Rhodes for me. And the reason I say Kel is Ryan looked better. Ryan had the better skills. But there was a thing where you always felt you could get at Ryan Rose physically, if you see what I mean. Now, he, he always seemed to lose to guys that weren't better boxers, but were just bigger, stronger guys. And Kel's probably a bigger, stronger guy. I don't know, man. I just think that right, look, Ryan beat Jamie Moore and he was a massive underdog. But Jamie, Jamie Moore's not Kel Brook. Yeah, I know, but I'm just saying, and they were all saying Jamie Moore were going to be the next big thing after the Ice Macklin, weren't they? No, but yeah, agreed. But you're saying Kel at his peak. At, at Kel's peak, he was a world champion and a deserved world champion. He didn't get a, a vacant belt. He won the belt against Sean Porter. Yeah. So I think, uh, yeah, I, I think sometimes we, we underestimate how people were worried for Kel in that fight, if you remember. Yeah, all right. Well, we'll we'll beg to differ on that. You're going to say Kel at one five four. I'm going to say Ryan skills pay the bills. I'd even say Kel at one sixty. Oh, would you would you say Ryan at one sixty? No, Kel, Kel at one sixty. Kel at one five four. Kel at one four seven. Oh well, I don't agree, but we'll beg to differ. The Ingle style. Uh, somebody's tweeted Dominic Ingle. I think it's Cam. Uh, Butty Butterfield, he's, he's tweeted uh, Dominic Ingle and sent him a video of Glyn Rhodes where Glyn Rhodes says the 
the Ingle style is not the Ingle style. It's the Bomber Graham style. Bloody blah. Dominic Ingle's bit on Twitter. Do you feel that this Ingle style myth is what it exactly is? A myth. Okay. So, so who had the Ingle style? Name me a fighter who had the Ingle style. Well, obviously, Bomber Graham, Johnny Nelson. No, no, no. Harold Graham and Johnny Nelson, two completely different fighters. Yeah, but Johnny had the hands down style as well, didn't he? Like Bomber. You, your hands down isn't a style, Russ. This, so my point is. Oh, well, this is we, not why I've got you on. You're a trainer. Yeah, so, so to, to say there's an Ingle style, it has to be consistent. There have to be things that these guys do where we're like, oh. Sweet oh, chicken, oh. Junior Witter. Okay, but who else switch hit really and did it well? Maybe Naz, uh, Ryan Rhodes, Naz, Ryan, kind of, but over time, Ryan, Kelly Reed. Had... Yeah, come on, man! Like <laughs> we're really going for Pele Reed on a Sunday morning. <laughs> <laughs> you kill me. Flash from the but... past. Yeah, no, mate. My point is Sheffield's there's... best electrician, though. Ah, oh, nice. So. Yeah, but he's not Sheffield's best Tyler. We know who that is. Chris Smedley. <laughs> the legend. But so so I've never bought into this thing that there's an Ingle style. Because if the Ingle style's Prince Nassim Hamid, no one else box like Naz. If the Ingle style's Kel Brook, then no one really box like Kel out of the Ingle gym. Yeah. I think there's I think Brendan had ideas on how to box, right? But I don't necessarily think it was a style. I think that was a media creation where it was just convenient because there were loads of talented kids coming out the gym. So it's the Ingle style. He's awkward. Yeah. Uh, he's got his hands down. He's just slipping shots. And But Kel Brook's not that sort of guy. Did you see what I mean? Kel, Kel's not a hands-down guy. Kel can switch. I've seen Kel switch. He can switch and he can box well as a southpaw. But he, Kel Brook's a pretty conventional guy. Pretty, he's a one-two merchant. And then you look at Ryan Rhodes. Ryan's a bag of tricks. You look at Naz. Naz had no stance. Naz had no guard. Really, he just he just moved and threw shots. And then Johnny Nelson was completely different to those guys as well. And that Johnny was a really conservative guy. And you know, Harold Graham was kind of between the two. Yeah, do you feel that Johnny Nelson's style were like throwing a jab and then uh, and moving backwards as soon as he's thrown it? You know, like kind of like a reaching jab. No, no, because you've seen Johnny hurt people. Like John, John, Johnny Nelson's hurt a lot of people. But I think sometimes when you start your career losing a lot, a lot of fights, you you become naturally conservative because you know what it's like to to lose consistently. So you're saying, I don't want to make those mistakes again. So I can understand why Johnny had the style that he did. Um, I think if you were taking Johnny from zero now, he'd probably box differently. But you know, they they got they got him where they needed to get him so he could win. All right then. Uh, what next for Ted Cheeseman? Ah. <sighs> uh. You know, we talked earlier about Denzel Bentley and how important it is to, to have a proper boxing education. Yeah. Ted Cheeseman's the case study for what happens when you don't get that boxing education. Ted was one of the best amateurs I've seen in terms of being a combination puncher, body puncher. He could do it all. Like, there's a reason why it was him. I think there was a kid called Steed Woodall in the amateurs. And they were, they were, they were, good, they were good talents or special kids. And then Ted seemed to turn pro and go backwards. Doesn't do half the stuff he used to do. You know, he now blocks punches with his face and all this sort of stuff. And I keep saying it, a lot of these boxing gyms and boxing trainers are a hoax. Like this idea that people are good trainers, it's a hoax. Like I struggle to name four really good trainers in this country. Guys who will turn you into a really educated boxer who's capable of navigating their way at world level. I can't think of many. I really can't think of many because for too long, it's been an old boys club. You, you get to hold the pads because you're a mate of so-and-so that's happened for too long. And these trainers aren't, they're not learning their craft. They're not learning the philosophy and they're not passing it on. I, Russ, a big part of training a fighter is sometimes sitting down 
and talking them through what it is they're supposed to be doing in the ring. Not even from a tactical perspective, but almost like philosophically. You know, this is what you're in that ring to do. And then you set your training up accordingly. And a lot of guys don't know how to do that. Oh, why, why is Russ? What is, mate? I just do I just do what I was taught. You know what I mean? Yeah, they made me run 50 miles a day. So I just ran 50 miles a day, Russ. Just make the kids do that now. I don't even try and change nothing. Why am I going to change nothing, mate? That's how we do it in the East End. Pie mashing liquor, mate. You know what I mean? Nah, nah. I am it's boy. dead. Pie mashing liquor. You see that oh, green liquor. rubbish. Yeah, that's horrible, mate. That food colouring and, and like, I don't know, tea leaves, whatever the hell it is. It's horrible, mate. When I went out for that meal with Mark Tibbs, he said, I'll take you for pie and mash when you come down. When we left Jim, me and Charlie Duffield, I thought, God, pie and mash, God. That... Anyway, we didn't have it. We went to the Turkish restaurant. And I think what you've just said there has put me off pie and mash forever. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't have it. But no offence no. against people who eat pie and mash. Yeah, for me, I feel for Ted. I feel, and you want to laugh at this, Dominic Ingle would have done a better job with Ted Cheeseman. Do you think? Yeah, I think so. But, I mean, Cheeseman, oh, oh, that's my next question. Cheeseman and Eggington, I'm not sure if I got their ages mixed up over there. Did I say Eggington were 24? And I think he, he mm. was 26 when and in Cheeseman were 24. Do you think they've got miles on the clock? And do you think that Eggington's made a good career move going to Mick Hennessy. So Ted shouldn't have miles on the clock. But he's, it. A, he's a top-level amateur. He shouldn't have miles on the clock, but he has because he hasn't been educated properly. Yeah. Like, you know, you have to hold people accountable for, for the consequences of their actions. And people messed up his career. Yeah. And you look at Eggington. I think Eggington had to go that way. Like, there's no real finesse to what Eggington does. So yeah. you're just going to have to walk through hell in your career. That's just your career. For him going to Mick, why not? There's TV slots, right? Like we said, Russ, it's about a platform. If you can get yourself seen in front of 3 million people, mate, you're worth more to sponsors than you were on Sky. Yeah. Yeah, I see what you mean, mate. I see what you mean. Uh, all right then. Uh, here we are. Access in the bubble. Uh, don't obviously. There's a lot of people complaining that certain people are getting too much access to pay per view shows. Basically, it's just Coogan and it for pay per view stuff, which is fair enough. Uh, do you think it should be shared out more? I know they had Phelps in there this weekend, didn't they? And is it is it Rob Tebbett next weekend? So do you think it's do you think it should be more than them three? Well, who's doing enough numbers to justify being in there? Yeah, exactly. It's a numbers game, isn't it? Yeah. If if you're doing more numbers than Coogan and you're not getting access, I understand if you've got a complaint. If you're doing more numbers than Michelle Joy Phelps and you're not getting access, I get it. If you're doing more numbers than the Rodent, I get it, right? A hundred percent get you complaining. But you can't be whatever, man, like some guy doing 300 views per video and then saying you should be given access to the bubble. What, what are you going to do for, what are you going to do for them? I mean, what value are you giving them? Nothing. Yeah. Do you know what I mean, Russ? Do you feel that people, when they get in there and they're in a position of a little bit of power, do you feel that they're not pushing these people on things that the fans want to hear? Because you know, obviously... The, 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 the old timers, you know, you got to fade Davis and Ron Lewis and Jeff, uh, all the rest of them. I like Jeff Powell, but, and, and he is very good at, at questions, but they don't push it to how we push it, do they? Do you feel that these YouTubers should ask better questions? No, no, I don't. Do you feel no. that Rob Tebbett's uh, reputation as being. I said somebody. I'm not sure if it was Eddie Earn who called him it or Coogan. The, the the hardcore's hardcore, and and do you think he's dined out on that reputation falsely? Because every time I see him and he gets them on the hook, he sort of earns earns face changes and he sort of, sort of backs off. Do you think Rob Rob bottles it when he gets him on the hook? Wait, I don't know what your obsession is with Rob Tebbett for a start. <laughs> you. Need to, you, you you, you need to get over this idea that he's some sort of boxing intellectual 
the guy, the guy, the guy. No, I'm not saying he's an intellectual. I'm saying it's what people say. I'm, I'm, I'm only going what they say, don't I? Listen, he's a clown that lives in Bedford. He's beans on toast because that that channel he's got ain't popping off like he's trying to pretend it is, and like the rest of them, man. Look, it's it's all it's that's a hoax as well. Let's start calling these things what they are, Russ. It's all a hoax. The idea that you can do a million views on IFL, like there aren't a million people that give a shit about boxing in this country. Like, don't get deluded by this. So, if I'm Rob, why am I going to ask the questions that the hardcores want to hear? Because there aren't that many hardcores. Do you think it's because he he, is well-spoken and educated that people think, and the words that he comes out with along, do you think that people sort of think that he knows what he's on with? Well, who says he's educated? Well, I I, I get sensed to fault time. People saying that he he, he puts his, puts things over a bit more elegantly than... than No, no, okay. But someone show me the certificates. Where are his certificates? We don't know if he's educated or not. He's an actor. He's a failed actor. Rob Tebbett's a failed actor, Uh, right? That, that's what he is. Like, he got a few gigs as an extra. That's the high point of his career. He went to drama school to become an extra. And this is who boxing fans want to call their hero? <laughs> yeah. It says all about boxing fans. They will jump on anyone's nuts that asks awkward oh. questions by accident. Yeah? By accident. He doesn't intend to do it. Yeah. Look, I, I, look and people forget, I know Rob. And I will tell you, Rob had no intention once he got that that boxing social gig, he had no intention of rocking the boat because he said himself, why am I going to ask these questions for the hardcores? The hardcores aren't the majority of my viewers. I have to ask the questions for the majority of my viewers. Yeah. And so you get casual questions and you, you get the surface level questions. You know, you're not going to be there trying to catch her now because that doesn't do you any good. And you'd only be pleasing about 100 fans who are going to tweet about it and go, oh, look at how we had Eddie Hearn rocking. Nah. Yeah, that's what, I'm, that's what I'm trying to get at. He had him rocking in an interview a couple of weeks ago, didn't he? The guy he who does the best the show, is didn't he? Nah, Uma Ahmed is the guy that does it the best. And I love the fact that he doesn't even intend to do it. Like, he'll just ask really obvious questions and all of a sudden, everything falls apart. Like, like, like Eddie will say, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm in talks with so-and-so. And then Umar will just go, what sort of talks? Have you rung them? Have you emailed them? And Eddie will go, this is none of your business. And you're like, ah! <laughs> yeah. I like Uma. He, he's probably, of all the people that, that do the, the microphone camera jockeying thing, he's probably the best one of the lot. Yeah, we're Team Uma, aren't we? At the moment. Well, we're Team Porky first, and then Team Uma. Ah, <laughs> go on, lad. Uh, <laughs> Tony Bellew. Uh, do you feel that his, his rimming is now out of control at Sky? Um, do you think it's on another level and it's become that embarrassing that he knows it and he's just doing it anyway on purpose? Or do you think he doesn't know what he's doing or he, he doesn't know or doesn't care? Wait, hold on. But, but, but I, I need to know the, the, the case from the prosecution. Uh, the case of the prosecution is he had Derek winning 7-5. Mm, oh, that's well, the same, but changed it to eight four within twenty four hours. No, but that, that's his mate, though. Like, look, like I said, like Russ, if you if you fought Mike Tyson, I'd give you at least four rounds at the start, like just because you're my mate. Yeah, but what if you're there to do a job in a working ah, capacity? Hey, do you know what? Mates over money. Mates over money. Go on, Terry. Are we getting to, are we getting Tony a pass on the Chisora card then? On the Chisora one, yeah, because don't forget all the times Bellew's been fair. Yeah. All, all the times where, where Price has been knocked out and Bellew's like, look, it's hard for me to watch this because I know how good he should be, but he's not there. Like, the, Bellew's generally a really good pundit. Like, I don't mind hearing him on Sky. I thought I'd, he was when he started, you know. I were team Tony for a small, short period. No, I like him. I'd like to see him do more of the play-by-play stuff. Like, I think it's a bit much with the Joshua fights. Like, you know, he, he definitely sings from the company him sheet when it comes to Joshua. Yeah. But outside of that, he's generally pretty fair. Like Froch, they say what they think. Yeah. All right, then. Well, I'm not going to give him a pass anyway, but you can. Uh, <laughs> who's in Hearn stable as a pay-per-view fighter after AJ? Because Dylan White's been knocked out twice now. Derek's 10 losses. 
Uh, who, who's his next? Who's his next pay per view? Where's his next pay per view person if he stays with Sky? Ah, uh, well, that's a good question. That's from me. Whew. I'm going to give you a wild card, and I, I can see them using the same approach they used for Dillian. But Fabio Wardley might be the guy they try and elevate to that level. If, oh, if, his, man. if his if his skills hold up, I can see them. Because here's the thing. Like Fabio's raw. Like he hasn't got the, the experience. But I've seen Fabio spar. Like he's got the heart. Like there's no question about that. Terry, you're trolling now. Come on. No, no, Russ, listen. No, get oh, man. No, no. Oh. Fabio listen. Wardley pay per view, Terry. Come on. Well, no, well, Russ, Russ, not next year, obviously, right? But there's a look, if you're going to build someone, you're going to build someone like Fabio Wardley, a guy who can really talk. You know, everyone's got a mate like Fabio. Like, like you, can, you can see bits of, you, you, you can see how he'd make money. But whether his ability will take him there, I don't know. But you're looking at someone like that because there's no one else. Who else is it on a pay-per-view level? Dave Allen. Yeah, I thought he retired. Well, he, he retires every week, doesn't he, Dave? Every time he gets up for training. <laughs> <laughs> every time he gets up for training, he puts quilt back over his head and goes on Instagram. If so, so Dave beats he... Fabio, does he get for British? Is he pay-per-view? Or is Fabio, if he beats Dave, no. pay-per-view? No, no, no. I don't think British title fights should ever be pay-per-view. Well, Joshua Dillon, what? Yeah, and I didn't agree with that. So... I just... I just don't think, because the British title's of no real consequence, you can kind of win a British title. Do you see what I mean? Things can well, just fall your way. Well, what about these pay-per-views that Derek and Dillian have for no belt at all? But they're beyond that level. We can both agree Derek and Dillian are beyond British level. Because the characters on IFL. No, no, they just factually they are beyond British level because they fought beyond British level. Yeah. So, so... You know, if if let's say they were coming up now, you told me Dillian versus Derek, they're both ten fights in their fight for the British. Would that be pay per view? No, 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 no. But they've kind of crossed that bridge. Yeah. And now we know what we're going to get with Chisora. Do you see what I mean? We know what we're going to get with Dillian, and when you put them together, we definitely know what we're going to get. But to what extent is the beef real? I think we now realize it's probably not. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, there's no beef there, is there, between Derek and Dillian? The businessmen, aren't they? Yeah, there's no yeah. beef in boxing when there's money to be made. All right, then. Question 20, I think. Sky's New Deal. Uh, does it get shared out or does Eddie Earn get another five year deal? So, ah, Jesus, I've just done an episode on my thing about this. I haven't released it yet, but. I think everyone stays where they are. I think the pandemic changed everything. So just from the people I know at Sky, beginning of the year, they were looking at maybe we need to open up the platform and we will just, we'll do it on a fight by fight basis when it comes to pay-per-view because Sky really like Dubois. They see Dubois as the future. Like they see, they've got Joshua and Fu- they've got Joshua now. They think they can get Fury, but really the future for them is Dubois. They see the future as being yard as well. And so there's more Frank guys they see as a future than Eddie guys. So they'd like to get those guys on the platform. But I think with the, with the lockdown, and they, they have to stick to their model now. So I can see them re-signing with Hearn for another three years. I don't know what Hearn's going to give them. But I think it's been made easier because the zone looked like they're in an absolute mess at the moment. Yeah. So Hearn, you can see Hearn now backing away from the zone. Just... No, not mentioning it, mentioning it as much as he used to, not being as gung ho for the zone like he used to be, and he's sort of inching his way back to Sky. But hopefully, Sky will negotiate the terms better. But here's the theory I have, Russ. I think Hearn's holding back all of these fights that we want to see until he gets a better deal with Sky. So I think he wants a bigger percentage, and then all of a sudden, it'll be easy to make Fury Joshua. It'll be easy to make Boatsy versus Yard. It'll be easy to make all of these fights all of a sudden, as soon as he gets his percentages up. All right, then. Uh, so you don't think Eddie Earns on his way out then at Sky now? No, who are you going to replace him with, Russ? 
Yeah. All right then. Well, you just mentioned about Ern easing up with his own, but he's all over the internet this morning saying that uh, they didn't talk to Met Canelo and Callum Smith, but yeah, Ant Canelo just left his own. Why would he want to go back there and fight on there when he's just left him? I don't get that, do you? I don't think it will happen on the zone. I think it will happen on a pay-per-view platform of some sort. I don't know which one yet, but I think it'll be pay-per-view. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about Callum Smith, if this is true, being signed on a management deal with Paul Reddy, who was Matchroom's matchmaker, and he left? And they signed Cal Yafai as well. What do you think about that? Paul Reddy was the guy that got that fat guy in for Fabio Wardley. Do you remember that big German yeah. guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was Paul Reddy's watch. I wouldn't have that guy. <laughs> I wouldn't yeah. have him managing me for sure. Well, I've just heard a little whisper that he's now managing Callum Smith. I don't know if it's true. Uh, Why isn't Joe Gallagher still managing him? I don't know. That's just what I'm saying. I'm only going on what people have emailed me. And do you think it's true? If it is, do you think it's a good move? So, if you're asking me if I'd rather have Joe Gallagher or Paul Reddy, I'd probably rather have Joe Gallagher. Yeah, but, but Joe Gallagher just if, had a fallout with Eddie. So that's the thing. If I need someone who's Eddie Hearn friendly, then Paul Reddy would make sense. So it depends well, what Callum Smith wants. Yeah. It depends what Callum Smith wants. Cal Yafai, I feel for Cal. Like, Cal Yafai seems to have missed the whole 115 pound division. Like, no Chocolatito fight, no Strissa Cap fight, none of those fights. They even had an Andrew Selby fight. It's guarded like there. rubbish, Cal Yafai, hasn't it? Yeah, after that whole that, that when you exposed that forty grand Russ in LA, wait, we're true, it? That was the funniest thing ever, Russ. Where well, you like? We got forty grand, didn't he, for fighting a world title in America? And 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 didn't the didn't the network tell them that they had seventy thousand for an opponent, and then they just gave Cal forty? So where's the other thirty gone? Exactly. Well, we know where that's gone, don't we? As always, uh, Eddie didn't Eddie bite on that. I think that one, one of my last ever tweets, won it <laughs> when I made my Twitter comeback. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Was it him or Barry? Someone, yeah, where they're like, you don't know what you're talking about. Well, Eddie said, No, you don't understand how it works. We'll stick to making tea for Dennis or something, something like that. Off, off Eddie, cheers, Eddie. Evening, Eddie. Uh, all right, then. Uh, what we got here? Let's have a look. Anyway, what did you show up with? Would show business accept Eddie if he did did one out of boxing? Because I'm seeing people doing videos saying he could be on his way out. If he goes, would the show business circle accept him? And how he is, or would he just be looked upon as a spoiled little old Fontelroy brat? Oh, it's different, right? In boxing, Hearn's a bit of a hero because he's different to everyone else, right? He is. He, you know, what, what, as much as we may dislike Hearn, he's, he's helped create this boxing world in which we're all involved in. He's helped create the Porky's Corner. Like, it's that energy that brought all of this along. Yeah. So he, he, he's, he's high status in boxing. Yeah. You take a boxing, he's just another lanky fucking prick, isn't he? Like, who cares? Who are you? If he were in my who, class at school, I would have terrorised him, Terry. I would have got his ear every day and I would have twisted it and said, oh, he didn't money. I yeah, but he's six foot five, him. Porky. I don't know. I would have sat behind him, mate, put him in an headlock at school, choked him out, twisted his ears up, took the Bunsen burner to his to his fancy sports bag or trainers. You know, Gripper in Grain Jill, I made him look yeah. like Mary Poppins. You know what I mean? <laughs> you remember Gripper, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Porky, yeah. the Hand legend. Over, that dinner money. Well, Eddie Hearn, I would have terrorised. So, so yeah. think about it, right? In boxing, Hearn can lord it over people with his Rolls Royce Wraith, with his with his Gucci trainers and stuff. Once you step into that showbiz world, and I saw this when I was with David, right? Like, to me, David Hayes is like a hell... Oh. You know I mean? We're not God, Russ. You know, to you, I know he is. But he's someone I respect a lot because he's done a lot in boxing. Yeah. But when you end up going somewhere like GQ's Man of the Year, and you're around like people who are making five, six million quid a film. Yeah. That's a different level, Russ. Do you see what I mean? Like, and Eddie will find this out. There are levels to this famous thing, and, and he's like at the bottom rung of it. Yeah. 
Yeah. And also, does he does he really want the paparazzi hounding his family? Because that's what happens when you cross over us. Eddie would be a tadpole in that fish pond, but whereas now he's a big, great white shark, isn't he? Exactly. Boxing. All right, they're moving on from old comb over Eddie. Uh, or Eddie Hills, 4-0 super amateur star from Billy Ricky, free by way of. <laughs> 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 we know that's not true, Eddie. We spoke to Billy Ricky. Uh, prospects in UK boxing, who's the next big star? Um. Ooh. Well, you, listen. When you make your debut, Russ, I think I think the world will will go crazy. You probably do a million pay per view buys on your own. Yeah. But I like the kid Ben Whitaker. I still do. But he's going to do the Olympics next year, I imagine. So we still will wait another year for him. Um. But look, you always have to look at the heavyweights. Like if you really want to talk about the breakout stars, it's normally the big guys. And we're blessed. So we're blessed with with three big lumps that could do good things. There's a kid called Solomon Dakers or Dakers. I never know how to say his surname. So he's based out of the Midlands. And he was part of the GB setup. He might still be. But I know he's signed with Sam Jones now. So he's sparring Joe Joyce at the moment. He's a really talented kid. Big, strong. Like I haven't seen wider shoulders on a heavyweight. Maybe ever. There's another kid called delicious Ori, who's also out of I think he's out of Birmingham and he's a young guy I mean who's part of the GB setup he's sparring Joshua at the moment and then there's a kid Courtney Bennett that I used to train I think he's the best of the lot and so these three guys and there's some other guys who aren't part of the the GB setup yet like Jamie Shakiva he's a big lump who can go I know Mark Tibbs is talking about this Johnny Fisher guy, but we don't know this guy, man. We don't know him. I think he went but, to Peter's because I got him some sparring. At Peter, we, we, you, I think it was. I think it was Johnny Fisher. I got. Uh, yeah, I think he was. Yeah. But, but you know. I don't know. Is he? Is he? I, 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 has he had some fights already? I'm not sure. No, he's I don't think he has. I, I don't think he's. I, I, I wasn't even sure if he'd boxed before. Oh, well, I don't know. I got him some sparring. It's an heavyweight, and he sparred you. He stayed up there a week because he rung me a couple of weeks ago and said, nice one. Sure. Oh. I, I, might have, I might have the name wrong. I might have the name wrong, but it was one of Mark Tibbs' heavyweights, and obviously it weren't Dylan. Yeah. So so it will, for me, you always look at the big guys, and so I think there's a lot of excitement in, in, in that sense. Ben Whitaker at light heavyweight is exciting, and then you're kind of scratching around. I like the look of the the 60 kilo female Hannah Robinson. I think if she turns over, she's got that perfect mix of being good looking and being able to really fight, which I think will help take women's boxing in a positive direction as well. Yeah. All right then. Uh, nearly done now. Uh, Clinton Woods against Anthony Yard at the peaks. I don't think we've seen the peak of Anthony Yard yet. I know you were going to say that, Terry. I know. No way. Yeah. But, but I have to back Clinton. And like, I'm a big Clinton fan. I'm a fan of what he was able to do. Yeah. And it like, if, if, if we're basing it on the best we've seen from both guys, then still Clinton. But a year and a half from now, it might be different. Yeah. All right, then. Shout out Clinton and Jason Barker. I know you're watching. I hope you're well. Tommy Fury, 4-0. Uh, has he got a future as a light heavyweight or could he do super middle? Uh, so I look at, I, I look at him and he's got quite a watery physique. I think you could lean that out. And I don't know if that takes you to 170 or 168, but you could definitely, you know, pull back on that. But I like Tommy. And you know why I like Tommy Russ? He's done the one thing that boxers struggle to do. He's crossed over. So Tommy Fury has a fan base that has nothing to do with boxing. Yeah. You know, you know, we, we always talk about the KSI Logan Paul side of things. Yeah. And I don't think that really works. But Tommy Fury being on Love Island has brought people who don't normally care about boxing into boxing. Yeah. And so you've got to give him credit. I know people say, ah, oh, you know, is he a serious threat to the light heavyweight division? We don't know yet. He's only 4-0. Oh. Let's, let's talk about Tommy when he gets to 10. Yeah. But I like what he did there. And I think a lot of boxers can learn from this, right? 
go and get an audience outside of boxing and you bring them into boxing and you will fight whenever you want. I promise you that. Yeah. All right, then. Will Frank sign anybody in the new year who's a big star? Is, has he got some up his sleeve, Frank? But who's a big star, though? That's the question, Russ. No, this is, this is it, you see. Who, who, we're, we're willing to jump shit. Who's unhappy at the moment? Is there any fighters out there? We, Bob Arum, Al Heyman. Uh, well, what I'm getting at is, well, is, is Frank going to sign Kel Brook? I might as well say it. There's, there's a rumour doing rounds that if Kel Brook got beat last night, which he did, and it, him and Eddie are no more, that he might go back there and wait with Frank. And if he did, who would he fight? What fra- fight would Frank want to put on for Kel Brook that would be pay-per-view and he could say, fuck you, Eddie? What fight would that be? Do you think it'd be the Khan fight or Beefy Smith? Because Beefy's unhappy at the moment, isn't he? Well, we, well, why did Beefy leave? Well, Beef is still ready in, is he? But he, he was talking retirement three weeks ago on Twitter. And um, plus, oh, since he's been with Eddie, he's been there a while now. Is it over a year? He's only four, Eggington. I know, and he was his sparring partner. So he's not delivered what he said it said it what it said in the brochure, has he, for Beefy? Hasn't delivered for Billy Joe, hasn't delivered for Warrington. Martin, Jay Ward, McDonald hasn't... twins. They were discarded like rubbish, McDonald twins, weren't well, they? Well, no, but here's here's something I've realised. Eddie Hearn sussed out what I've been saying for a long time. A lot of these fighters and these trainers, they're all they're all they're all smoking mirrors, man. It's all a hoax. And like, who needs the McDonald twins? I like, don't do. They're irrelevant in in the world of boxing we're in now. The McDonald twins are irrelevant. Martin J Ward isn't relevant anymore. The, these guys were relevant five years ago when you could have things like Prize Fighter. And you could have shows that are your core consistently. You need to have a larger than life personality now. You can't get away from that. And you need to be able to fight too, because that's the era we're in, man. It's we're in the attention economy, Russ. And yeah. that's all we're trying to do. Every sport, football, boxing, we're all trying to get attention. So if you're a boxer and you have no ability to gather attention for yourself, it's hard for you, man. You're not going to get the phone call. Which bring what you just said there is correct. It brings me to the next question. I've seen a lot of things that people have sent me screenshots or social media. Eddie's hanging out the back of David Allen, which is fair enough. But Hunter, he was complaining that he only had nine thousand subscribers. Uh, Eddie is saying that he, he didn't do anything for him, and it, 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 the fans don't know him and that. But yet. In it, we thought he beat Povetkin, but they gave it a draw. But yeah, Dave Allen do not own a belt. Um, he gets more chances than Hunter. Do you see where I'm going with this? Yeah, but that's on Hunter. Okay, Michael Hunter's not boxing. What's he doing with himself? Resting at home for his next session. No, 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 no. Well, well you, you don't need 18 hours of rest, Russ. Like, what's he doing with himself? Clinton Wood used to work, you know, as a plasterer and still train even up to fighting for European title, I believe. So, so, so I think that that's halfway towards my point, right? Yeah. He only trained two hours a day, Clinton says, doesn't he, on that interview I did with him. So what yeah. are you doing with the rest of your day? Exactly. So Michael Hunter could easily be promoting himself. Michael Hunter could easily be hustling for opportunities outside of boxing. Get, get on Dancing with the Stars. I don't know. Get on some kind of reality show. I don't know, right? You can do something. Stop. And look, boxers need to stop sitting there waiting for the phone to ring. Yeah. We're not, we're not in that world right now. We're in a world right now where there, there are more fighters than there are available slots. So if you're not putting your hand up, if you're not drawing attention to yourself, you're not getting on there. Do you feel that... Uh... People like Callum Smith, John Ryder, Huey Fuey, Savannah Marshall, Martin J. Ward, McDonald Twins, Michael Hunter, the list, list is on, uh, uh, Sam Eggington. You know, do, do you feel that uh, Beefy Smith, do you feel that these people, because they're not constantly doing interviews on IFL, Boxing Social, Behind the Gloves, you know, the big three as we call them, because they're not doing interviews out, out w- with them, hanging out of the back of them, that they're not going to get the opportunities that you David Allen and Shannon Courtney is getting people like that. Uh, it's tricky. 
Do you think that's so, why? Because so, we're talking about John Ryder here, who everybody thought beat Callum Smith. Now, if that had been Joe Gallagher, who had John Ryder, he would be screaming it from the rooftops. We all remember Crawler Linares, Paul Smith, or Abraham. They weren't even close fights, them first ones, were they? But they were screaming it from the rooftops. And do you feel that because these kids are not putting themselves out there, that they're, they're probably... Like you, he don't put yourself out there, Savannah. You can't, you can't get, a, you can't get a word out of him. They're hard, they're an hard interview. Even in okay. company, and you're in restaurants, so they're very quiet and shy, and shy people. Do you feel that that works against them? Uh, Huey's different, right? Because Huey will always have that Tyson link, so he doesn't even have to do anything. Yeah. You know, when you see Fury, you're like, oh, which one is it? You already, you already know. Is one or the other. So I don't think Huey has to do too much. S same thing with Savannah. Savannah will always have that link to Clarissa Shields. So you will always talk about Savannah, whether she's visible or not. So yeah. I think I can get it with those guys. Um, guys like Liam Smith, I'm like, well, what are you doing for yourself? You know, all of these guys, what, what are you doing for yourself? I'm Ryder. Yeah, what are you doing for yourself? You just sat there waiting to, to get the fight. Nah, the world's moving on without you. So you got to find something to do. You think social media's changed boxing altogether, Terry, for the better or the worse? Ah, oh, God, this is tough. So I don't believe social media has done anything to help people sell tickets. I'm one of those guys. I don't believe it does. Now, give you an example, Russ. I once put up a video of Dave Caldwell getting into it with a troll on Instagram, right? Mm -hmm. That video did 70,000 views, Russ. Yeah. Do you know how many additional followers I got for 70,000 views? Uh, 10. 10. 10. 70,000 views, 10 followers. 1.95 million impressions, whatever that means. It's all, it's nonsense, Yeah. Nothing beats the reputation you have in the real world. Nothing. Because it's that reputation that you turn into a social media follower. It's not the other way around. You're not going to become popular by being on Twitter. You're going to become popular by what you do in the real world. Yeah. All right, then. Um... You know what? what I was going to say, Russ. That's why when you see all these guys at Ultra Tech, sporting icons, Hatman Strikes Back, the reason their followers don't go up is because that you don't see them out and about. Yeah. You don't. So I, I can't work out whether this is a good guy or not because I've never met him in person. So I'm not going to follow him. I follow you, Russ, because I know you personally. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. All right, then. Uh, final question, then, I suppose. Uh... Joshua Fury, does it happen next year or is it now going to be 2000? Are we going to be talking 2021 about it happening in 22, like you said? So the big if is what happens with broadcast deals and when does that get sorted out? So Hearn won't make the first Joshua Fury fight until he signed his contract. So the earliest it can happen is the second half of next year. But I imagine the second half of next year, Usyk will be saying, eh, it's my turn, guys. So I wouldn't be surprised if it's 2022. Do you feel that it's going to be overcooked, like Brooke Khan and Manny Pacquiao against Floyd Mayweather? Uh, I think boxing is a dying sport. So I think every year the boxing market gets smaller. Mm -hmm. But I think Fury Joshua transcends all of that. I think the country will stop. Two Brits fighting for all the heavyweight belts, the country will stop. That, that, as long as the belts are still in play, Russ, that fight will never... You think that's up. important for all the belts to be on the line? I do. Do you think it's even more important for it to be in the UK? Yeah, I can't see, I can't see them doing it anywhere else. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. If they did it in China or Saudi or America, would that be a bit of a kick in teeth for British fans that have invested so much time in these two kids? Well, 
Y yes and no. If if we were able to watch it at a normal time over here, then whatever. You know, we can still make a night of it, you know. But the people who love the live experience will miss it. Look, Russ, you know me. I always go back to Brooke Golovkin and how much I loved the build-up. I still think it's the best event Eddie Hearn's ever done. Because it was the last matchroom event where the fans and the boxers just mingled freely. What, what event was that? Uh, Brooke Golovkin. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so as, as long as you had, like, as long as you got there early enough at the weigh-in, you could just mingle. Like, I remember I told you this. I remember just being sat in Nando's, me, Spider Richards, Connor Ben, and Bernard Hopkins comes in and just starts preaching boxing to all of us, man. We all just sat there soaking it in. Imagine that. Nando's in the O2. Jesus. Jesus. Somebody's just uh, text me and uh, saying that uh, boxing is dying. I get that all the time. Well, so the average age of a boxing fan goes up every year, Russ. Yeah, so where, where's, like, where's the new blood coming in? My kids don't want to do it. I've bought them um, uh, all sorts of equipment and gloves and they're not interested. Not so, as... so... They've tried it, but they don't. They want to go on iPads all the time. It, it's uh, it's quite upsetting. It's it, it's weird, isn't it? The world's moved on, Russ. So if you think when you were coming up, Russ, you know, boxing was how you proved you were tough, yeah. or karate or whatever. Combat sports are how you proved you were tough, right? And now you look at it. You get older. Now you've got kids jumping off houses on BMX bikes. You've got kids climbing up fucking walls with no ropes, just barehanded, just climbing up walls. You've got kids doing other stuff that's brave as fuck. So, so that pool of people who would have normally gone into boxing has been dispersed across five or six different sports now. So the pool's smaller. And then all these kids have their own audiences because, you know, snowboarding is YouTube friendly. Um, parkour, that free running stuff is YouTube friendly. BMXing and skateboarding are being uh, YouTube friendly, and you're like, I don't have to get my head punched in. I can just do these tricks and not get my head punched in. But they're just as brave as anyone that boxes. I've tried it with my kids. Reggie didn't want to do boxing, so we took him to a place in in Rotherham, judo and stuff like that. One session, one for him. Ruby I've took her to this sprinting thing. She didn't want to do that. She did one, one, went once, and that's it. And they're back on iPads. They don't want to go golf balling. I take my dog over here to uh, Crook Hill Golf Club on a Sunday morning. I let him have a turnout on Putting Green because I'm banned from pub there, aren't I? 19th foul. So I get camera a little wave. Rocky has a turnout. We come home and I see golf balls all over. Well, that's where I used to go as a kid. There's conquer trees. I said, Do you know what a conquer conquers are? My kids didn't even know what conkers were. I used to be at school with mine. I used to varnish them. In end, I got, uh, my conkers, I soaked them that much in vinegar and varnish. That I'd hold it with, uh, with, with boot lace and they'd get splattered. So I ended up getting a pebble and I drilled through it in my dad's garage and put all, uh, con you know, conker shell around it, glued it all and I was like, we're about a 500 -er. <laughs> I'd just stand there like that and let everybody's conkers splat on it till I got stuffed <laughs> out. All the skin were coming off it, wasn't it? And it was a pebble. But my kids aren't interested in that. We used to get these really thin pieces of wood that long, put a piece of shoelace on it, and then a Eric Bristow flies or a John Lowe. Remember him, old John Lowe? With yeah. With the top at darts. And I'd throw it, with, and then you hold on to it, and you, you string it ends up in your hand, doesn't it? We'd, I'd make them cricket, football, all sorts. And my kids don't want to do anything and they're on iPads all the time. But you can't let your kids out anyway. We've got a pandemic and it's place. You, you, there's a lot of bad people about, isn't there? But the point I want to make is 20 years from now, are we going to be in a, are we going to be like Americans, fat as a pig Michelin man, like that? Or, or where, where is it heading? Because I spoke to Mick Whale about this and, uh, he, he, he's, he, he's, he's told me a few similar stories with kids that he knows that they're on iPads and I know other people whose kids are, are on them all the time and is it TikTok 
concrete craft roblox i mean my kids will say to me dad i want some money for roblox so you, you get it mate it's 18 pound 49 they last them 15 minutes on the back for more is this how it's going society aren't kids going to be joining boxing clubs terry what, what? Well, but porky you're a dad right mm -hmm. why have you bought your kids ipads because they got them at one Christmas, I think last Christmas or Christmas before. I think I think they've had a couple since then because they don't last, do they? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can't use them after a while, and yeah. and so I think I think my point is this: until parents make a conscious decision to go, I know I'm yeah. going to be unpopular. I know I'm going to stand out, but my kids are going to play outside. They're going to learn to climb trees. They're going to go out there and learn to be around other human beings. Until parents do that, mm. we're never I'm going to change. It. I'm not good at tough love. Yeah, because what happens is parents do this for themselves. It's never about the kid. It's about how a parent looks to other parents. That's why that's why you got kids dressed in Gucci at like one year old. The kid doesn't know what the hell Gucci is, but you're basically going, look at my kid. Look at how well-dressed my kid is. And so parents sometimes need to look at themselves and say, am I doing this for the kid or am I doing this for me? And I think that's probably the first step to solving the problem. Because once you start doing that, you'll go, okay, I think it's a good idea for my kid to be physically fit and physically oh, healthy. God, physically fit? That's a like, swear word. Yeah. I, don't, no, I, don't, I don't see any, but it's not just my kids. I see I know. other kids the same as it. And I think it's a problem. Yeah, I do. I, it scares me. It scares me, Russ. It scares me. Scares me, mate, but I just think it's because, a problem. Because especially now, now that there's no amateur bouts happening, kids are like, well, what am I going to the gym for? It's a rare kid who will still keep training now. A lot of these kids are like, oh, what am I doing this for? And so this is going to be that lost generation of boxing. Yeah, this is what I'm worried about. I'm really, 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 really worried about it. My kids are come, coming in, he'll point stuff out to me on YouTube. Oh, you're not doing this, you're not doing that. Dad, you're not putting tags in, so I don't do that. Yeah, but you should do this, you should do that. I said, all right, like, oh, nice one for that. And it, they're more educated by computers, aren't they? And, uh, you know, things like that. And I think it's quite uh, worrying. Because did you know the the... My kids are eight, and I was Googling something the other day. The average, this is, it's only an inch, but a child's waist is one inch bigger now than it were in 1979. Did you know that? Yeah, but with kids, that's a big deal. Yeah, for, a, for an eight-year-old, one inch. Yeah. On the stomachs. Do you know what I mean? And if you yeah. go back, if you go back to 1947, but when my dad was born, it's two two and a half inch from now to 1947 because kids were out. They were out then, weren't they? were playing on bomb sites around here with Germans. So, and so, so I did an interview with, with my friend Greg Hackett and we're talking about this, Russ, in terms of boxing. Yeah. That the kids don't have the running in their legs anymore. No. Like, like when we were young, you ran about, you climbed trees, you did this, you did that. You were naturally strong because you were active. Right. Yeah. So if someone said to me as a kid, you got to run two miles or three miles, I could just do that because we ran around it anyway. But these kids now, because they all sit at home, they can't run three miles naturally. They're driven like, to school them. as well. They're driven to school. Yeah. I mean, it's no good, is it? And when I was a kid, I walked to school, but they're driven to school, kids nowadays, and you can't move outside schools in the morning. I see parents driving the kids to school who live 200 yards away. Because everyone's scared of paedophiles, man. And and I don't want to sound like like I'm fucking Nigel Farage here. But sometimes we need to turn these CCTV cameras off for a couple of days. And let's just go and find all these wrongings that are making our kids scared to be out in the streets. And let's just go and deal with them. Yeah. Yeah. Like like the purge. Give us two days, right? And just just kind of let it be known who the convicted sex offenders are. And let's just all go and pay them a visit and just make sure that our kids are safe in the future. Is it your country, Terry? Because you're from Zimbabwe, aren't you, originally? Yeah. Is it your country where they went and got all them sort of people like that, lined them up and shot them dead? No, no, no. That's not very Zimbabwe. What country is that? That, that, be, that could be Nigeria. It'd be Nigeria, like Nigeria. Are they at war at the moment, Nigeria? 
I think there's a bit of unrest. But is that, is that next village? Next village to where? I mean, not next village. Next country to where you lived? Nah, man. It's for us. It's about a seven hour flight. Oh, is it? Oh, right, right. All oh, right then. Sorry. So, yeah, and Africa's huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. West coast of Africa. Where's that then? That's Nigeria, Benin, Togo, Ghana. That way, out to yeah, Liberia. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it must have been one of them countries where they got all these. Uh, Pedophiles and whatever, and just shot, shot them, shot them, uh, shot them all, and let all villagers stone them and stuff like that. I just dealt with it. In England, everything's an issue, isn't it? Human rights and all this, and and the thing is, we never really. I think in Britain, our problem is we don't really deal with things from a point of principle. Mm. Principle number one: kids should be safe to walk to school. Yeah, right. And that means that might mean that sometimes you got to have speed limits of 20 miles an hour. Sometimes you might have to have traffic-free zones. I don't care. Kids should be able to walk to school with their mates and feel safe. Mm. It's, not, it's not too much to ask, is it? No, I just feel that... I was talking to Robin Reed about this on Thursday, and he, he, he was saying there's, there's no for them, is there? I mean, something like Robin Reed, he should, be, he should have, a, have his own gym, shouldn't he? And it should be funded by council, Olympic medalist, free, you know, world time... Free free world title belts in house, aren't they? If you count the WBF, you know IBO, WBC. <laughs> well, he's got three belts, aren't he? Uh, in house, uh, if you could say two world title belts, Olympic bronze, and he's not being used, is he? A bit like Bobby Moore. When he died, he only had seventy seven. He was worth seventy seven thousand pounds his estate. Bobby Moore. Could you imagine Beckham die, die, dying now, and he only had seventy seven grand? It, Bobby Moore weren't used by FA, Worry, You know, it sickens me. We've got all these... Clinton Woods, he doesn't seem to be doing anything with boxing board of control, does he? Bobby Moore didn't do anything with FA. And, you know, I, I don't know what where boxing... Obviously, boxing's my number one sport, but I'd like to see more funding for gyms and kids. It brought into a school curriculum, you know, where they've got to do not contact boxing, but boxing training and stuff like that iPads have to be took off them because they, they're on my kids do classes at school, eight year old, and some of the lessons, Terry, are on computers, everything's on computer. So the the computer literate all day, aren't they? Yeah. But they're not necessarily life literate. No, no, yeah, because they're not because they're protected, aren't they now, kids? I mean, I saw an interview the other day with uh, Alex Ferguson and he said that it's not, not Alex Ferguson, Paul Scholes and, and Michael Owen were speaking about how they made their own way to training or they got on the bus and that. Uh, Scholes and all, all, all them sort of people, when they were when they, they got YTSs or whatever they got, they, they went on bus to training and they went back to the digs and that. Nowadays, the footballers who, who are turning pro at the big clubs, the other stars, the, the, the chaperoned, aren't they? And they're putting big houses. They're, they're giving like millions of pounds at a young age, aren't they? And the, everything's done for them. I think they were saying everything was done for them kind of thing. Uh, and there's no leaders at Man United on the pitch and at Arsenal and that. But whereas back in the day, there'd be like a Tony Adams, you know, bounding forward. I mean, I remember Tony Adams when he came out, it was last game at season, and he came out in his half and sort of like went running on a run with ball. And he was and like, just big, scored. And you scored. Remember he blasted and like, yeah. ee-haw, ee-haw, ee-haw. What's he doing out of his half? Get back there in that half. But it was a big thing. And then they were all going on about I were a leader and all that. And he were a leader, you know, your shearers and people like that, Tony Adams. And, the, and, and nowadays, you look on pitch, Arsenal aren't got a leader, have they? Man United have not got a leader, have they? There's no leaders there, is there? Pop- you know what's happened? Oh, that's a good, oof, terrible one. So, so what's happened is it's no longer cool to be a man. And it's no longer cool to have those traits that we associate with being a man. It's not cool to be strong and it's not cool to impose yourself. And it's not cool to to demand things of other people it's not cool to hold people to account all these yeah. things are are no longer cool because with technology the nerds are in charge now and because of that russ we live in a world now where it's okay to be soft in fact 
it's it's more acceptable it's desirable to be the victim now because yeah. when you're a victim it's a, you can get the same amount of attention as a winner can but you don't have to put half the effort in so i might i might tweet something like i've had the worst day ever today and that will get 200 likes and a few retweets and a few replies but if i say you know i just want a trophy people just ignore that we need to get back to a country that loves winners that's what we need a country that loves winners that loves winning you know what you've just said there is correct i watched a documentary the other day i'm always watching them and it was carl lewis and carl lewis when he burst on the scene did you know carl lewis were running times in college that would have won him a gold medal in 1980 in moscow did you know that oh yeah but because of the boycott they didn't go yeah, so in 1984, he made up for it, didn't it? And 88. But the point I want to make is, Carl Lewis came out, he was like the first big superstar from track and field, one, you know, mega money. And he basically yeah. just said, I'm Carl Lewis and I'm here to win and I'm a winner. And people couldn't get it at first, could they? They didn't get it, did they? Until he sort of like retired and made all this money and that. And, and, and the Americans are like that, but in England, it, it's we have this trait where as we play victim and it's good to be like an Eddie Eagle type or a Frank Bruno type. Or, and I don't like to use this term a lot, Dave Allen. You know, Dave can turn it on and off, can't he? It's good the glorious like, loser. Hey, yeah, the, 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 the what? The glorious loser. Yeah, the humble guy, Mr. Humble. It's good to be that and, and you know, I'm going to try my best and I don't know if I can do it and all that kind of thing. And people, we tend to get behind people like that. Whereas you people like O'Hara Davis, who says, look, I'm going to knock him out. We all, well, we all tend to hate people like that, don't we? Do you know what I mean? Which I've never, and I've never understood this. And I like, like I, I like people who, who back whatever they say. Whatever you say, if you make it happen, I respect you. If you're like, I'm going to take his head off, and you go out there and you take his head off, congratulations to you. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, there's nothing wrong with that. And it's why, if you look at why sports struggles in this country, we don't have sports that lend themselves to those moments. Look at America. In American football, you make one tackle, you're a hero for the whole game, Ross. One tackle. Or you make one catch in the end zone, you're a hero. Wow. Now, you take, let's take rugby league, for example. Let's say I'm, what's his name? Let's say I'm Ellery Hanley, right? Yeah. And I, and I beat five or six people, score a try. I've still got to get back on the pitch and play again. Like, no one celebrates that moment of genius, really. Like, you don't have to get 5,000 replays. And I don't get a chance to run around the pitch and do a silly dance. Yeah. And that's what you need in this. Like I told you, it's the attention economy now. You need stuff like that. That's why American sport is booming over here, while British sport is dying over here. Yeah. I don't like to bring this up because because people are always on about Frotch again. But somebody asked me the other day, "Oh, why are you always uh, bigging Carl Frotch? What made you follow him?" Well, I followed him obviously from when he turned pro. But I was at one of his earlier fights. He fought Damon Haig. Do you remember that fight? No. He fought Damon Haig for a British title, and he was defending his Commonwealth right. And Carl did an interview afterwards, and he was asked what something, and he said, "Listen." So he said something like, you'll have to go on and watch the fight and watch the interview. And he said, look, if people want to come and fight the Cobra, bring it, but train hard. And, I, and it was just arrogance. And I remember him getting sla slaughtered in boxing magazines. And and in them days, there were like forums and that. They were hammering him on and uh, saying he were arrogant. And, and Adam Smith used to say he was surrounded by hype. But Carl, Carl and me call it swagger. He had that bit of swagger, that bit of edge. You know, and... And, and I noticed towards the end, he sort of were like, he didn't have that swagger, you know, towards the end that he had when he were coming through. After the Ward fight. I think the Ward fight knocked it out of him. Well, Ward just battered it out of him. Back to that, don't you? They both had lumps on him, aren't you? You should have seen Ward's face after the fight, mate. Oh, no, I spoke to Ward about it. He said it felt like a tough sparring session, but nothing more. Yeah, yeah, I bet you did. He did, and that's why he was always winning. He's like, listen, I'll fight Carl anytime, any place, and then Carl went missing. Well, why didn't you fight him in Nottingham when they were offered it? Well, why, why, why would you go from the west coast of the US to Nottingham when you're the guy that won? City ground, a city ground. No, it's, it's a city ground, mate. Nottingham mate, 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 it's Andre Ward, not fucking Brian Roy. Do you know what I mean? No, Andre Ward's never fought outside America. He doesn't need to. 
He needs to come to England to prove himself, Andre. <laughs> <laughs> you always have to throw that one at me, don't you? The Andre Ward one. You know I don't like Andre Ward. He annoys me. Uh, he's, listen, the way he handled Froch, I thought he was going to give him a suit. him to bits, mate. He got robbed. No, he didn't, man. What happened to hey, that second Because you've punch? met Andre Ward, you, you won't have anything said about him. No, well, there you go, you see. I've met him in person. It's not just fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> you mad man. But so, no, no, back to the point, Russ. Yeah. We need to get to a point. And I know, like, it's kind of felt like we're, we're trying to put the world to rights. I'm not we even trying to put the world to rights. Don't we and get them out of yeah. the house? Yeah. You just want your kids to be capable of A, looking after themselves, and B, being physically capable of functioning in adulthood. That's all. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. I give my kid two brand new footballs, both of them, right? And and now, when I see them, I say, Where's your balls? They show me them. They're flat. I said, I've been playing with them. And now, so they were six quid each, them balls. You know what I mean? Good ones as well, mitres. Mate, we used to we used to get plastic bags, stuff them, tie it all together with a bit of fucking what do you call it? Cut up tire. You know the, the rubber out the yeah, tire, yeah, yeah, yeah. the inner tube. Tie that together. Play football from like like ten a.m. on a Saturday to like six o'clock on a Saturday. Just playing yeah, football. I used to do all that, man. I listen, mate. Nothing happened where I grew up unless I were there. I was the always, I was the one with the ball. Nobody could play till Big Porky turned up with his Casey. You know what I mean? Big P. Big P's here with his Casey, the one that gets, it's like a cannonball when it's raining. (laughs) (laughs) And there was this brat who used to come onto the field and he had like proper 30 quid football and that. And Adidas ZX 600 trainers, or is it Adidas ZX 750 now? They're still out now, aren't they? Yeah. Well, in, in 83, if you were cool, you had a, a pair of Patrick Stabils or Puma Hardcore. Puma Hard play. But if you were a spoilt brat from Tickhill or Wadder for Warmsworth, you'd have ZX 750s. And this kid come up field. He's got these ZX 750s and shiny ball. And everybody were like, oh, easy, Porky. We're going over there, play with his ball. And I'm there carrying my ball. I'm like, like woo. <laughs> It was like a cannonball because it was raining, but them other ones used to skid off at uh, off at surface, didn't they? A good ball, whereas mine had just take all turf with it. <laughs> and you'd, <laughs> you'd wear broken foot. <laughs> but... And you'd never edit it out at Sky because you'd be knocked out like that. <laughs> I said, Dad, I want a new football, my dad would say. It's not the football, it's the player. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, yeah. The perils are growing up in a mining village. Uh, and, then, and then you just became a pool shark. Yeah, they I had a pool table at home dinner that were out in a pub, so there were no else to do, so I took pool up but from from being a young age. but It just became the Mayweather of pool. The Mayweather of pool, I wish. My eyes have gone now. Hmm. But, yeah, I've enjoyed it today. It's been emotional. We've had a good chat. Yeah. We've wrote, wrote a few wrongs, thrown a bit of comedy in, give a bit <laughs> of an opinion. And uh, because I swore a couple of times, and I'm not going to get me four quid now. <laughs> yeah. I could, I could get it took out, but it'll cost me forty to get it edited out at the moment. The way things are going, I need to brush up on my computer skills, don't I, Terry? Save some pennies. Hey, I because I've always edited my own stuff. Yeah, save SYPS some pennies, eh? Do some editing myself. Do an editing course, eh? Need to just... Hey, you know what, I, mate? I learned to do it all. I can do it all on my phone. I do everything on my phone. Yeah, you sent me them links, didn't you? They're all right, though. I'm just a bit complicated for me because I'm a bit, bit of an am and egger, aren't I? If I were a boxer, I'd be, <laughs> I'd be like Spider, Spider Rico, wouldn't I? Out Rocky. <laughs> 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 That'd be me, wouldn't it? <laughs> you know what I mean? I'd end up on Skid Row. But, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so all right then. Well, listen, you take care, Terry. Have a great Sunday. Thanks for coming you on. You too, mate. No worries. Don't have nightmares, and, uh, mate. Don't have nightmares. And uh, <laughs> you'll keep on trucking some. All right, mate. Cheers Take it. Uh, well, that were Terry from London, born in Zimbabwe. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the... Uh, the I'm not going to say show because that's a bit cringe, isn't it? I hope you've enjoyed the episode today. Uh, I think we've just spoke... Terry speaks eloquently, doesn't he? A bit like Rob Tebbett. Whereas I'm, like I just said, I'm a bit of an am and egg, aren't I, with my accent? But I've enjoyed doing the episode today. 
and uh, I hope you all liked it. I've got a. Uh, I'll just tell you what we've got booked in for next. There's a lot of. There's no. There's no slots available on Zoom now until until Friday uh, Saturday. It might be one on Friday night, but I think it's going to be Saturday now next, and Sunday next week until the, there's any slots available. So if you want to come on Zoom, everybody's welcome. There's uh, we're going to try and do two a day maximum. That's too much. That's probably too much. Ten a week's enough on Zoom. So if you want to book in and you can't get in for next week, you can book week after. Uh, it's Porky Corner at mail.com. No capital letters. Not that I think that matters. Uh, and get get your uh, get your email sent in, and somebody will be in touch with you. All right, uh, I think that's about it, really. Covered a lot of stuff, haven't we? I think I've said what I wanted to say. I've saved a bit of stuff back for some videos I'm going to do this week. Uh, we wish Kelbrook all the best. My take on it, not Terry's take. My take is. I think he probably will go off rails for a bit, but I hope he doesn't because he's likeable, Cal. But I hope he, he knuckles down. I'm not really bothered who he trains with, if it's Coldwell or Dominic Ingle or that Spanish dude. I'm not really bothered. I'd like to see him go back to John Fuchs and give John Fuchs a chance because he didn't get beat with John Fuchs. I'd like to see him work with Glenn Rhodes and John Fuchs. So he's got a bit of experience in corner and Fuchs the young, up, young emerging trainer. I'm not going to say inexperienced. I'd say young and emerging so and if he's going to get the car and fight get it on on bt sport with brick top so i think it's a good fight so but there's loads of fights that i'd like to see but we're just not happening other these fights we're, we're told about when well, the dangle carrot and it just gets away from us they just go off down another area and it's starting to annoy me a bit at moment boxing don't get a minute do i <laughs> Uh, it's starting to annoy me. We're told Fury Wilder were going to happen this year. Don't look like it's going to do the third one. We're told Wilder Joshua were going to happen last year. Didn't happen. We're told Fury Joshua were going to happen next year. It's now looking like 2022. So I don't know. There's a lot of intangibles going on at the moment, isn't there? But it is what it is. So it's now gone one o'clock. Five past one oh one five. Uh five past one. So Rico's on at two o'clock today. That'll be interesting. Uh so there's two videos going out today, two zooms, which is good for you, isn't it? Uh I might put one out tomorrow as well. Split them up. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. I'll probably put them out today, probably run them outside of each other, see who's popular, see who's the most popular. They had a bit of a battle last time, didn't they? But I think they did all that last time, about 3,700 and odd, weren't they? Or Rico's were. Good interviews, both of them, good interviews. So I hope you've enjoyed it. All right, shout out to Matt Skelton in Essex. How are you doing? Frank Smith in Berry. Cam Butter, Butterfield, how are you doing, Cam? Hope you're well. Paul Cross, let's have a look. Let's give him all a shout out. Give a few a shout out. Ooh, uh, Mark Siddall. How you doing, Mark? Steve Oil Guy in Wales. How you doing, Steve? Don't crash that Porsche. Dale Nichols, Ozzy Smith, Gazette Workshop, Smido, Tommy Adwin, Jamie Roberts, Cameron Butterfield, Rob Kelly, Jane Couch, Andy Patterson, Terry, who's just been on, Charlie P, Nick Manners, Showy, Rami. How are you doing, Rami? Like Sheffield, hope you well. John Bennett, AJ, Frank Smith, Steve Goodwin, Peter Fury. Fano, hope you're all well, Matt Skelton. Can go on forever. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching. Like, share, and subscribe. Get to your pals. If you don't want to do that, don't. All right? I'm not forcing anybody to do it. But big shout out to Mickey Theo and John Fury. I've heard that fight could be happening next year now, but. We're going to see if it's all hot air. So I hope it does happen. I'll be there ringside. Can't wait. Big shout out to John Fury as well. John, don't have nightmares. <laughs>